Well, coming up in November is, well, another election. And uh, one of the races that's countywide is Mason County Superior Court Judge. Uh, excuse me, Judge. And the uh, lady who is in that seat right now is Kadeen Ferguson Brown. First off, Your Honor, I um, want to thank you for taking some time on uh, to get this uh, interview in place. And I think what we want to do to start out is who is Kadeen Ferguson Brown? All right. Thank you so much, Diedrich, for having me um, on your program. I do appreciate the opportunity to at least come on here and answer that main question, right? Because I think that's a, that's one of the questions that a lot of people have been asking. Who is Kadeen Ferguson Brown? And um, I did want to start out with pointing out that at my core, I am interested in fairness and equitability. Um, that's what I think drives me in almost everything that I do to see fairness and equitable treatment wherever I go. So that's something that is important to me. Um, so my life experiences have molded me into a person who strives to stand up for what is right and what is just. And so that's what I think led me to becoming an attorney and also a judge. From a very young age, I developed an interest in um, the rule of law and I was fascinated with how the rule of law allowed society to function. Uh, so that became something that was very interesting to me. And then it also opened my eyes to the injustices that um, were around me. So at an early age, and most people find this weird, but at the early age of six, I started telling people that I was going to become an attorney because an attorney gets the opportunity to fight for people's rights and fight for people so that they can be heard. And that became part of who I grew up to be because I had that main goal to become an attorney. So in pursuit of this, I ended up attending the School of Legal Studies in the, at University of Wolverhampton, England. That's where I did my law studies. That's where I got my law degree. I ended up with a high honors degree. It is the second highest degree from the University of Wolverhampton. Um, in the law, in the, in the legal studies. After completing that, I migrated to the United States um, and I took the New York State bar exam um, and passed. And after taking the New York State bar exam, um, I got married to my husband later on and we migrated or we moved, relocated here to Washington. Once we got here to Washington, I then took the Washington State Bar exam as well and passed that. So having both um, bar exam under my belt, I went out and started practicing law. And in New York, I started my practice. I worked with um, two attorneys at first, and then I went out on my own and I had my own law practice and I managed and maintained a law practice for over 14 years um, before becoming the court commissioner in Mason County. When I was practicing law, I focused on family law and immigration because they kind of correlated. We had a lot of um, people who needed citizenship, um, who also ended up getting divorced, who also ended up wanting parenting plans, and so the two kind of worked together, especially when I was on Whidbey Island and we had a lot of military members. Mm -hmm. That was how the prop, the the the, the, the my my attorney, my law firm kind of came full force together because I realized the need that was there for an attorney who was able to do both. So I kind of focused on family law and immigration, and. Later, after leaving Whidbey Island and moving over to um, Kitsap County, 
I extended that focus to include dependencies and workers' compensation. I also was a guardian ad litem. I think we've heard a lot of people saying mm -hmm. that. I was a guardian ad litem um, from, uh, from Whidbey Island. And I typically got appointed to the most complex cases because of my legal background and the ability to analyze these cases. So um, I did guardian ad litem and I did my law practice both in Kitsap County and in Mason County since 2016 up until 2021 when I became the court commissioner. So in 2021, I became the Mason County Superior Court Commissioner after the judges did an application process and they selected me as their court commissioner. And a year later, I went through a, another grueling um, application process to get the appointment as judge um, after Judge Finley decided to retire. Um, so since becoming a judge, I have presided over the juvenile, the civil, the criminal, and the therapeutic courts in our superior court. Um, so that's me on a professional basis. Okay. Another part of me that is, I think, the people should know about is my community involvement. Um, I think it's a very important part of me to be consistent and um, show an ongoing commitment to community involvement. And so from a very early age in my teens, I would volunteer at orphanages. I advocated for youths. I started a summer mentorship program while I was in high school. In law school, I volunteered at a community um, center that provided services to disadvantaged youths, like food and um, help with homework and mentorship. I also, in New York, I participated in legal clinics at various churches and community centers. I helped out at different domestic violence shelters. And then um, here in Washington, my community involvement has been a little bit more organized and through recognized organizations such as the Moderate Means program that provides services to um, litigants who were unable to afford the regu regular attorney price. So mm -hmm. they give them a, a scale and then they would charge and they would send those clients to me to represent them. So I'd agree to um, represent them at a lower price than I would a regular client. We also had the legal assistance to military personnel that I would represent um, clients through on a pro bono or moderate means basis and Northwest Immigrant Rights Project. I also, rep that was pro bono. I sat on boards and committees such as Red Cross, Habitat for Humanity, NAACP, Dream Jamaica, and Agape Unlimited. With my sons and my husband, we volunteer at, right, at various food banks, church outreach, and military outreach, because my husband is a member of the Navy, or was, he's recently retired. Um, since becoming a judge though, I kind of have to pull back those volunteer services. Um, and we'll get into that later with regards to my role as a judge, but I have purposefully um, joined and volunteered on the Superior Court Civil and Criminal Committees the um, Minority and Justice Committee, and the um, Certified Professional Guardianship and Conserv Conserv Conservator Board, um, because I wanted to bring a voice of the rural counties to these um, statewide organizations. Um, a lot of times we are not represented when they're having those discussions. So becoming someone who would be willing to be present in the room when these decisions are being made and rules are being made is, is important to me to represent Mason County and what rural counties are going through. So I've done that. And most recently, 
I have been actively working with Shelton YMCA to try to bring our, or introduce the YMCA mock trials to the schools, mm. the high schools in, in, in Mason County, and with the school districts to try to introduce the um, judges in the classroom program that we also have. So community involvement is very, very important to me because in being involved in my community, people get to see me and, and, and get to know more about me outside of my role as judge. But not only that, I get to help in creating a safer, um, healthier, and more informed community. And we can work better at getting fair and impartial treatments throughout. So that's always the goal. That's always the core thing that's driving me. Um, outside of my work, so I have work, community involvement. Personally, I am married to a wonderful guy who was a member of the Navy who recently retired. Um, I also have four boys who keep me on my feet. One's at soccer right now and one's waiting on going to the um, birthday party. They, they don't stop. And, and I am very committed to my family. My family is priority for me. And I and when I say family, I'm I'm from a culture where extended family is important. And so I'm always encouraging my relatives to come and visit, or we're always planning trips to go visit our relatives. So I think that covers me in all different aspects that I can think of. And that's Kadeen Ferguson Brown. Okay. So when we were setting up this uh interview, you were I'm, I'm going to say concerned because you have certain rules that you must follow as a sitting judge, and that's under the Judicial Code of Conduct. How does that determine what you can and can't talk about? Right. So the Judicial Code of Conduct is the code that governs all judges, right? And it's broken up into um, a, four sections, um, and each section kind of govern different aspects, but with the main idea that the judges must be at all times impartial and um, independent. And it, that is the, the, the goal uh, of, of, of the code of conduct. So it tries to keep us where we are focused on making sure that nothing that we do impacts our role of being impartial and independent. So Canon 1 places a general requirement on all judges to be impartial, comply with the laws, promote confidence in the judiciary, and avoid opportunities where it is possible to abuse our authority as judges. So Canon 1 is kind of like the general rule. Um, and then we have Canon 2, which governs us on the bench, right? And so in governing us on the bench, it, it, it dictates that we must be competent in every case that we hear. Um, it also requires that we must exercise due diligence and we must be impartial and fair when dealing with these cases. Canon three then governs our role off the bench and in the community. And that's the canon that kind of covers what we can and cannot do. Um, for example, if there's a controversial um, group, it, it, it clearly states we got to stay away from that because that may come before us in the courtroom. And if, that, if, if we are outside of the courtroom representing this group, then people on the other side will not feel that they'll get a fair shake if, they, if that matter comes before us in the court. And so Canon 3 governs that and, 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 and requires us to um, limit our involvement in certain organizations and certain activities, especially those that are um, big issue tickets. Uh, it, it, it also kind of requires us to not necessarily share opinions, on, on issues, you know, issues of the day and stuff like that. As judges, we don't have 
that opportunity to talk about what we think and what we believe should be right. We can do that with our family, but not outside of that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's canon three. And then canon four governs judicial elections and campaign activities. And this prohibits a judicial candidate from participating in any partisan politics and campaign activities that are inconsistent with the independence, integrity, and the impartiality of the judiciary. So those canons come together. They, they are essential in ensuring that judges act in a way that does not um, interfere with their job as a judge. And that's the reason why we have to think really hard before we say yes to interviews or before we say yes to participating in an activity or joining an organization or even going to different fundraising events because we have to ensure that our actions will not give someone pause as to whether or not we're going to be treating them fairly when they come before us. So that is the reason why um, our code of conduct definitely tells us and, and requires of us that we think uh, and, and, and pay attention and even line things up with the code of conduct to see whether or not we should be participating in them. Okay, since we're talking about impartiality and fairness, how do you ensure that you meet those canons in your rulings? Um, it's not easy. It really isn't. Uh, to be impartial and fair means that we must be objective and have an open mind. So our personal belief as a judge doesn't play any part in our decision-making. And we have to ensure that it doesn't play any part in our decision-making. What, what is of importance to us when we are making our decision must be the facts that of the case that are before us and the law that applies to those facts. Um, that's it not our beliefs, not our opinions, not our biases. And so we have to, on a regular basis, ensure that when we go on that bench, we put aside our opinions and our thoughts and we listen in, we actively listen in to the arguments or the testimonies and the evidence that is presented. And then make sure that the law that we are applying is current, and is applicable when we're doing so. And I, in doing that, we engage in impartial and fair decision-making. Uh, I do, I, when I, I was thinking about this and I thought of um, an instance or an example of when, when I was an attorney, um, I had a case that um, I, I represented a father who spent majority of his his life, his adult life, incarcerated. And mm -hmm. during that time period, he um, lost or a number of his children were taken um, by CPS and they were rehomed in foster homes. And I think some of them were even adopted. But later on in life, he changed. Um, while he was incarcerated, he changed. And there were two younger children that he really wanted to fight for. And so as his attorney and recognizing that there was some change in him and he, this wasn't just lip service. He was talking, he was really, he was talking the walk and he was walking the talk. Um, I represented him before a judge who knew him who knew of everything that happened before now and could have easily used that to judge him and say, no, nope, I'm not going to listen to him. He's done this before. He's had these opportunities. But that judge recognizing that each case should be taken differently and separately, and it's based on what the facts are currently, that judge applying impartiality and fairness listened to our presentation, listened to the information that was provided by the social worker and the guardian ad litem, and eventually 
this father was able to reunite with his two younger children and has successfully parented those two children since. Um, just before I became a court commissioner, I was informed that one of the children, the older daughter that was taken before, was also returned to him. Um, and so he got an opportunity where he was allowed an impartial and fair judge who wasn't going to prejudge him based on things that happened in his past, but was going to look at the um, facts that were placed before him, the, apply the law, even though he knew his background and that may have weighed in his decision somehow, but was not the only thing that he took into consideration and allowed him the opportunity to reunite with his children and father them. And so in seeing that as an attorney, that is one of the things that I, as a judge, aspire to continually do with the cases that come before me, not folk, not prejudge um, people who come into my courthouse, but listen to them and listen to the facts that pre they present and apply the law. So my next two questions are kind of on that lines and you kind of covered it, but I want to get a little bit Take a di different twist to my next one. Okay. When you have a difficult or controversial case, do you take a slightly, well, what is your approach to that case? Is it different than what you would do any other case? So it's not much different, but I, I, I in, in cases that are complex and controversial, I slow down. Um, I, I, I have to apply some patience because there's so much coming at you, right? And I, 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 I don't want to miss anything and I don't want to get anything wrong, which I'm not perfect. So there may be opportunity, there may be times when that, when I do, but I, my, my, my goal and my aim is to slow down and, um, apply my process. Because I am confident in my process in making sure that I get the facts and then applying the making sure that I'm applying the current and the relevant law. I, so I'm, I'm very confident in that. But in these cases, it really does require that I slow down. Um, and that's one of the things that I do when I have difficult and controversial cases. Another thing that I do when I have more, more so controversial cases, is to um, remind myself that it's never about me. You know, my role is, it's really never about me. And so I try not to take things personally. And I try to make sure that I put those things aside when I'm applying my process. Uh, and, and that's how I deal with difficult and controversial cases. Now, you mentioned in under the uh, code of conduct, you have to, you know, put away your personal beliefs and just follow the law. My next question was about those possible personal beliefs that uh, contradict established law. Um, again, maybe we, you should repeat that you follow the code of conduct that you're required to do. Is that right? Yes, I, 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 I will. Like I said, from a very early age, rule of law has been my thing. And so I'm a rule follower <laughs> and I try throughout my life, I try my best to be on the right side of rules. So I'm not going to change that anytime soon. Um, but when my personal beliefs conflict with the law and um, what I need to do, I'm human. I um, sometimes feel like it's heavy, but at no point in time do I use my personal belief because that's not what I'm, I'm, I'm elected to do. I am, or appointed in this instance, I am not supposed to use my personal belief, so I don't use my personal belief. Uh, I, I wanted to share with you my process when I'm going onto the bench because okay. it's very important um, to me 
in, in ensuring that and reminding me that this is not about Kadeen. So Kadeen's personal belief doesn't apply. So um, when I first started working at Mason County Superior Court, um, Judge Goodell, who is one of my mentors, he said to me that um, once I'm on the bench, I am no longer Kadeen Ferguson Brown. I'm Judge Kadeen Ferguson Brown. And it may not sound relevant, you know, or, or, or that deep, but when you stop to pay attention to it, it means that you've put aside this person and you're now operating in the authority that you have as a judge. So every time I'm gonna go up on the bench, instead of just putting on my robe, I step into my robe. So I put my feet in first and then I put my hands in and then I zip myself up. And what that does is that um, signifies to me that, okay, here we go. My oath to uphold the constitution now applies. My, my oath to follow the laws of the state of Washington now applies. Um, so I'm going to go out there and I'm going to be impartial. I'm going to put aside my biases and I'm going to hear what these people have to present today. Then I'm going to apply the law that applies to this instance. And that's my process every time before I go up on a bench and every time before I make a decision. So um, that I think helps me to overcome the conflict between my personal beliefs and my role as a judge. So you mentioned that, sorry, uh, you mentioned that uh, you you were overseeing the drug court, is that correct? Yes. What are your thoughts on alternative sentencing? Okay. So I know you asked, what are my thoughts? And like I mentioned earlier, with regards to the um, code of conduct, it's not necessarily what are my thoughts, but how do I see it? How do I apply it? How do I use alternative sentencing um, as a judge? And I just want to go back to, to uh, um, kind of explaining what we're talking about. So in our criminal justice system, where we have an accused who was found guilty um, either by a trial or by a plea, a guilty plea, the court is required to sentence that person to confinement, right? Um, if that person is eligible for an alternative sentencing, then the court can consider that when considering sentencing that person. So first, the person has to qualify for an alternative sentencing. Um, and then alternative sentencing include um, our therapeutic courts, which Mason County has a mental health court, a drug court, and a veterans court. And I have mm. presided over those um, before. And, and it's a very robust and comprehensive program. And people... Sometimes they take up to two years to go through the program and um, they are held accountable. Sometimes they are sent to, to jail for a day or two because they're not meeting the requirements. Um, apart from the therapeutic courts, we also have alternatives through DOC and those are the um, drug offender sentencing, the Parenting, sentencing, I think they, they also call that family sentencing, and the um, special sex offender sentencing, and the mental health alternative sentencing. So those are through the Department of Corrections. Um, these sentencing alternatives, I see them as just tools that equip um, or, 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 or judicial system with ways in which we can hold uh, people who were convicted accountable and also offer to them rehabilitative measures, right? And so uh, we have the opportunity to not only hold them accountable and, 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 and have them pay 
for the crime that they've committed, but also rehabilitate them and get them to a place where they can re-enter society and, 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 and contribute to society in a, in, a, in a good manner, where they themselves are now safe and healthy to be a part of the society. So it's, it's one of the tools that we have um, as someone who presided over the therapeutic courts. I have seen that it can be successful. I have seen where we've had um, participants going through our program, struggling, but then not giving up and making it to the end and graduating and coming out and working back into our legal system you know, because mm -hmm. they are now safe and healthy to be a part of us and not confined and um, locked away. Well, Kadeen, I'm going to give you one opportunity. It's going to be your, your, your 30 second elevator speech on why you should return as Mesa County Superior Court judge. Well, thank you for that opportunity. Um, I should be retained as the Mason County Superior Court judge because I am the most qualified candidate. You know, I am the candidate with the judicial experience who have presided over hundreds of complex and some controversial cases. I, I am the uh, judicial candidate with the right legal experience because our Superior Court hears majority of cases that are in the civil civil law arena and that's where my legal um, experience came from. I didn't mention earlier when I was talking about my role as an attorney that I also worked as a conflict attorney at as the Island County Public Defender's Office mm -hmm. but that wasn't my main focus. My main focus was in the civil law arena um, and this is the area that we see most of in our superior courts. Um, so you have so many different types of cases that we hear on a daily basis, protection orders, domestic um, ITA cases, dependency cases, and even um, where we need to appoint guardians um, in, 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 in guardianship matters. And, and these are things that I am very familiar with and have worked for a very long time in that area. And I can bring that wealth. I can continue to bring that wealth of knowledge to the um, court with regards to criminal law matters that that takes up about a quarter of what the, of the cases that we hear. But that doesn't mean it's any less important. It is important that any matter that is being heard um, as a judge, that I'm competent and that I, I, I provide diligent work. And that's who I am. That's who I've always been. And I, throughout my time as a judge, one of the things or one of the comments that I keep hearing from people who have appeared before me is that I make them feel like they have been heard, whether or not I rule in their favor. That is what we want because that is how we build confidence in our judicial system. And I will continue to do that if Mason County allows me to do that because I believe that is how we get for we move forward. That is how we ensure that we have safe and healthy communities. And that is how we put people behind bars when they need to be behind bars. Um, I am the judge who has the right personality. Um, I am not someone who's quick to judge. I'm not someone who, who's arrogant. I'm someone who's gonna take the time that is needed to um, think through, to apply the law, and to listen to those who are before me. So Mason County residents, come November 7th, vote to keep me in, in, in my position because I, I have nothing but um, good 
that I'd like to bring and continue to bring to our courts. Okay. Kadeen Ferguson-Brown, thank you for some time. Thank you so much for having me, Diedrich. I appreciate this opportunity.